Neil, um, welcome to my kitchen. Thank you very much for coming in today and uh, talking to us about this important subject. Like all my guests, I bought you a present. I bought you a gram of Coke. No, I bought you, <laughs> <laughs> I bought you a bottle of wine. Oh, thank you very much. Do you drink? Oh, I do. Yeah, oh, good. Got to make the most of what's legal. Okay, exactly. So um, I, I've read your book, uh, and this is one of the sort of most mind-blowingly disturbing i had to send you a text the other uh, email, a message on twitter didn't i i'm um, saying uh holy shit this is blowing my mind it it is absolutely uh, mind-blowing stuff where we've got to with the war on drugs it is yeah it is indeed um and you know when people talk in this uh, in this debate what's missing is an understanding of just how bad things are and how we've come to the point we are you know the cause and effect and it's quite clear in our history can i just say to anyone listening to this please listen to this all the way through because this is a really important subject i mean i think it's possibly the most important movement globally there is right now i think it would cure a lot of the world's problems and I, i'm not being too sensationalist with that am i no, absolutely not. On, on, on every level, it, this, it's, it's the most important social justice issue of our time, that, that's for sure. Uh, but it's also about corruption, it's about stigma, it's about how, how, how we live with each other. And uh, the, the war on drugs has created a situation where within society we judge people and to criminalise people for what they do in this way is just horrific. Obviously the war on drugs has been going ever since I've been born. And that means that I've been totally brainwashed the whole of my life towards what I believe drug addicts are and the drug industry and, and everything about drugs. I've been totally brainwashed. And yet I think um, uh, prohibition's ridiculous. I think Al Capone was evil. You know, we, 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 had, we, we saw it all happen once and we recreated it exactly again. It's, it's the definition of stupidity, isn't it? Or insanity, insanity yes, yeah. ab ab absolutely, doing, doing the same thing. And the evidence from prohibition in America is very clear. You know, that's, it, it created organised crime. Uh, you, if you gift that market to organised crime, then they will take advantage of it. And the situation now, in it, the, the market, the drug market in the UK is worth £10 billion pounds a year. Yeah. That all goes into the hands of organised crime. Yeah, and as I say to you, if you're listening to this, um, make sure you listen all the way through because later on we'll be discussing corruption. And corruption, I, that's the bit which really got to me, mm -hmm. is the fact that we believe that we live in Britain and all our law, our lawyers, even though I've been through the family law courts and <laughs> that's a game I don't, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about another time. But, but we believe our police force, we believe all our, our justice system, we think it's all legit. And we are the leaders in the world at this stuff. And then you only realize that there's bent coppers everywhere because of this industry. It's, mm. quite, it's, it's horrifying. It's a horrible situation. It is, absolutely. I mean, I, I have come face to face with that corruption. It's almost got me killed in my, in my undercover career. But even I was shocked by what we found in the research for this book. It, it's astonishing. Okay, just for anyone, I mean, I, I would have done a quick brief intro before I met you, but tell us a very quick summary of your career. My career. Uh, well, I used to do uh, level two undercover work, which is uh, street level, uh, down and dirty, uh, purchasing drugs to infiltrate organised crime groups who supply the drug in, in cities, primarily heroin and crack cocaine. I did that over the space of 14 years, between 1993 and 2007. Caught lots of gangsters. In fact, I put people in prison for, in to for a total, cumulative total of over a thousand years. So I was very successful at what yeah. I did. <clears throat> so um, what then changed your mind on it? Well, I, I mean, I, at the start, I believed in it. I believed in what I was doing. I was very pleased to be catching the bad guy at the end of the operation. But, but in order to do that, I had to manipulate vulnerable people and put those people at further risk. I justified doing that at the time, that the end justifies the means. But eventually... It took a long time for me, actually. Uh, the penny finally dropped. That the reason my work was getting more and more difficult year after year, that organised crime was getting more and more violent every year without fail, was actually my fault. Well, not just me, but people like me who did the same kind of work. Because, you know, police are brilliant at catching drug dealers. Brilliant. They'll catch them year after, week after week if you give them the resources and the instruction to do so. But police were more likely to catch the low-hanging fruit than the top people. So it thins it out. It's a Darwinian thing. 
and the most successful gangster who is, is the one who is the most willing to be violent. So over time, the policing of drugs makes organised crime more violent. So I was contributing to that. So eventually, and I had, looked, had to look back on my 14 years of undercover work and realise that the end didn't justify the means at all. Not only was I causing harm to individuals who actually needed help, but I was also making society more violent because of organised crime response. Because police never shrink the size of the market. Never. You can arrest, you can fill the prisons up, you could double the population in prison with more drug dealers. You could do that with the resources, but it doesn't change the shape of the market at all. Policing only, it doesn't reduce the, shape, the size of it, it only changes the shape of it. And that changing shape is increasingly more violent. Yeah, your book is the history of uh, um, the war on drugs. Um, it's such a good read. Well, such a horrific read at the same time, but such a good read. And um, it is you, the point you keep making out in it is just getting worse and worse. Uh, even in this country with guns, it starts out with very few guns. Actually, you explain it. Because well, to, we, we really wanted to explain this change over time in organised crime. So in order to do this, we went to Liverpool. It was a, a classic place for uh, organised crime. And we interviewed three generations of gangster from that city. The first one, who was a right-hand man of Curtis Warren, a very famous gangster. In fact, he, he once featured in the Sunday Times Rich List. How? How did that happen? Well, it's because he hadn't learnt how to hide his money better, which, of course, <laughs> which of course organised crime have done now. That, that You won't find it so easily. Right. But yeah, he actually got into the Rich List. So his right-hand man, we interviewed him. And um, he got into the heroin supply at the beginning of the heroin explosion in the 1980s. The second one we interviewed got into it sort of 15, 20 years later, um, where organised crime became more corporate and more international, more sophisticated. And then the third one we interviewed uh, was a 16-year-old boy who had escaped the exploitation of drug dealing that was what we refer to as county lines. He'd been doing that since he was 13, 12 or 13. Perhaps the most important question we asked all of these three was, as you were getting, as you were a young man getting into organised crime, drug dealing, how easy is it for you to get a gun? And the old lag said, well, I could have asked and I would have been taken to the higher ups and I would have had to explain exactly why I needed a gun. And then they would have said no. They would have said to me, why on earth would you want to draw attention to yourself and to us by using a gun? Mm. If you've got a beef with someone, just go toe to toe with them. Like, you, you know, old school. The second one, said, well, you know, we knew that we could have access to automatic weapons if it was really needed, but the younger people, we wouldn't let them have them. And, you know, we, we increased the amount of arms we had in response to when, for example, the police increased armed patrols. The third one, the 16-year-old, he said, well, I'd probably need till the end of the day. In fact, the last time I needed a gun, he said, I went to the guy and he said, you're going to have to wait a few hours. He said, but I've got a hand grenade if you want that. Jesus. So he did. So he took the hand grenade. He was 15 and he took this hand grenade home and had that in his sock drawer for three months. And that was over a territorial beef over drug dealing. Mm. But this is a change in our lifetime, in living memory. And if you just go back to the 1960s, because we're talking about heroin control here, this, this is what the principal commodity of these gangsters is. We've gone from the doctor controlling that supply with a prescription pad to 15 year olds with hand grenades in our lifetime we people need to realize the cause and effect this is that happened because of the misuse of drugs act so what happens when people like uh uh el chapo or um who's the other guy from narcos uh escobar pablo escobar, when the police actually get them because you make a good point on this i've been watching your twitter feed and everything when people get them that means more chaos it's not a good thing is it no absolutely and this this is this is part of the deception as well from from law enforcement whenever at, and this is at any level this is from street level right the way up to cartel level if you catch someone and you destabilize that market as i've as i've explained you don't shrink the market the demand remains the same so what you do is you disrupt it and it creates an opportunity for someone else to step into that shoes and for the for the such a lucrative market 
there is generally disputes to try and get control of that. So it creates violence where people mm. fight it out for dominance. Okay, we're going to go into more detail uh, in all this in a minute. But I think it was when Peter Blexley came on, it's first was the first he's mentioned in your book quite a bit actually he was the first person who said yeah we should legalize drugs and i actually took seriously because he's an ex-copper and knows his stuff i went i wasted all my time trying to bust drug uh gangsters um i I then went away and thought how do you actually go about legalizing it what does it look like so so we'll we'll go back over why we've got to where we've got but let's work out how you would actually uh, leap uh, your organization how you actually think it would work in this country with all these drugs well, f- first of all, you have to realise that drugs are not just drugs. They're all individual commodities, individual things with different uh, regulatory difficulties. So the easiest one, actually, is the most problematic drug, and that's heroin. We just go back to the British system where someone who has a problem with it, you prescribe it to them. It was when we stopped doing that that we created the problem. In 1970... Okay, I, think, I, think we've got to, I think we've got to um, just, just explain the British system because it runs all the way through your book. We, we had a system in this country which worked, which was fantastic, until yeah. the Americans decided, or well, basically put pressure on us to change it. What is the British system? How does that work? Well, the British system is a fairly simple premise, is that if someone has a problem with drugs, they get help. They get medical help. It's a medical solution. It's nothing to do with policing. That was the, the British philosophy for a very, very long time. And we were very late, actually, to American-style prohibition. But the Americans wanted the whole world to follow this prohibitionist model, and they forced us all into it, really, with the 1961 treaty. So the the British system meant that no one had any incentive to find new customers. So a, a problematic heroin user was prescribed by the doctor they didn't need to sell heroin to anyone else to, to, to fund their habit. They didn't need to steal. So there's a time in mem- living memory and there was a no criminal association with drugs at all. At the time the Misuse of Drugs Act came in, there were 1,049 heroin users in the UK. 1,049. 20 years later, at the, when the heroin explosion happened, that went up to 350,000. That's the cause and effect because if you've got a problem with heroin, and people who have a problem with heroin tend to be people who have got some kind of childhood trauma, if you've got that problem, you've got choices. You can steal to pay for it, you can allow yourself to be sexually exploited to pay for it, or you can find customers. And organised crime love those people who will find other customers. Mm. So it's exponential. It's, it's the ultimate uh, marketing. And that's how we got from that point to there. So heroin's the easiest one to regulate. P- pyramid system. It's yeah, the ultimate. The right? ultimate pyramid system. Yeah, the ultimate. I need drugs, so I'll sell drugs to get my drugs and create more. Uh, which is where the term pusher comes from, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And and it superheats the system. And it's a, but it's it's such a clear cause and effect. It's it's diff- you can't really argue that. And the evidence is in our history of how well we managed it before. At the time, in the nineteen fifties, for example. When the Americans were trying to persuade British politicians to follow their way of doing things, the Americans measured their heroin users in the hundreds of thousands because they banned it in the 1920s. At the time, they were trying to convince us to follow their way. We measured our heroin users in the hundreds. Yeah. So we only followed them because of things like the war debt. You know, They could put genuine political pressure on us. We still owed money for the First World War. Yeah. And then the second came along. Well, they did the same to the South Americans, didn't they? Mexico and stuff. They made them. Exactly, yeah. And, and they've lost m- probably... Sorry, that's my uh, phone go. They've probably lost millions of people in the drug wars down in South America, haven't they? Oh, yeah. Tens of thousands every month die. That's the front. Tens of thousands? Tens of thousands. There's over 100,000 died last year. You are joking. No, no. It's the front line of the drug war. So we legalise that. Rather than all these people dying, suddenly they're making money. Because it becomes, you know, the, the country becomes wealthier because that's where we get our stuff from, right? Absolutely. But the, the, the whole, the, the way that the market works, the illicit market, it corrupts the, the very institutions of government, like Mexico and uh, the, the other South American states. I, I, why, why, did Ameri- why was America so keen on prohibition of drugs when they'd seen the prohibition of alcohol not work? It's about racism, it's, it's fundamentally about racism. So, for example, um, opium wasn't banned. There was no problem, you know. Uh, white housewives were using opium as a, as a remedy, health remedy, in the, in the 19, early 1900s. No problem at all until they had 
uh, Chinese immigrants come and build the railway railroads in America. Mm -hmm. When they started to integrate into society, racism demanded that their behaviours were controlled. So that's why why opium was banned to control Chinese people who were, you know, there's newspaper stories about Chinese people corrupting white women with opium. Cocaine wasn't banned until southern black people were seen to be using it. This is in 1920. So when it's just an extension of the Jim Crow laws, that that's what that's about. In the 19th, what are the Jim Crow laws? The Jim Crow laws are basically when uh, after the American Civil War, uh, the North won, slavery was abolished. Yeah. But the South kept the philosophy of slavery by bringing in prejudiced laws, uh, obviously, which led to the right, civil rights okay. problems. So the prejudice was written into law and written into their society, and it's just part of that. It's it it was a way of what was seen to be their problem. It's not, it wasn't accurate, but it was, a ra- it was from racism. So then in the 1930s, uh, cannabis was banned there because Mexican immigrants were seen to be coming, taking white jobs. And it was the Mexicans who were seen to be using cannabis. They even changed the name to marijuana to make it sound more Mexican. Right, okay. It was all, it, all about racism. Right. All about, and, um, and that's what's driven it. It's, it's always had that foundation. Even alcohol prohibition was about prejudice, actually. Because it was um, it was the Protestant white establishment who were threatened by Catholic immigrants, the Irish and the Me- and the and the Italians, who were, had a drink drinking culture, and so it was a way to control Catholics. <laughs> Go on, sorry. The, what, one of the biggest uh, supporters of um, of and com- uh, proponents of alcohol prohibition was the Ku Klux Klan, because they hated the Pope. But then the knock on effect is just horrific, and all our politicians. Um, by the way, all our politicians should be made to read your book and listen to what LEAP stand for and everything else because it is such an important subject. But we're all buying into it. You still see Theresa May stand up in Parliament or whoever her predecessor is and go, drugs are bad, we'll get rid of them. Yeah, OK, they're not great for your health probably. But but the, the, the image that I've been given, brainwashed all my life, is that uh, addicts are evil, drug dealers are obviously evil, you know, the police are there to try and shut it down. It, none of it's working. And, and, and oh, I don't know, it, it, it must frustrate you, it's frustrating me. Well, well yes, it, it does frustrate me, but I, I have to be optimistic. I mean, I, I think you're right, politicians do have to pay attention to this, but increasingly they are. You know, my organisation, we meet with a lot of politicians, and there's been massive shifts just in the last three years, actually. Um, there's, there's good politicians in every party. There's people like Crispin Blunt in the Conservatives. He's very good on this topic. Uh, the Labour Party now have an internal campaign to actually cause the party to adopt drug law reform policies. That's run by Jeff Smith and Thangam Debonair, very good politicians. So we do have allies in the world of politics in this topic. Is LEAP a global organisation? Yes, we're a United Nations uh, accredited global organisation, started in the United States in 2002, and we're, we're expanding rapidly. Uh, we launched in Scandinavia last year. Later this year, we will be launching LEAP France as part of the growing LEAP Europe. We have Leap Germany. Unfortunately, Leap Brazil have had to disband and go completely quiet because they are fearful of the new regime. But that is a stark reminder that in calling for drug law reform, we're actually championing human rights. Do you worry about your safety? Trying to close down drug rings or legalise drugs? Uh, well, if, if suddenly there was a big surge of... Um, public support for LEAP, I certainly start watching my back more because the people who who most do not want reform is organised crime, obviously. It's it's a strange um, a strange combination. It's a, it's, a, it's a strange thing for people on the same side to be politicians and gangsters. Some yeah. moralising politicians and get really? the same thing. You, you think it's strange. I bet a lot of the listeners wouldn't. Well, <laughs> what does LEAP actually stand for? It's Law Enforcement Action Partnership. Okay, and what, do you, what are your major policies? Well, we call for the regulation of all, all of the drug markets. Do you want the same policies throughout the world in every country, the same techniques, the British system or whatever it is? Well, I mean, the British system most applies to heroin, uh, but there are man- many commodities which don't need a medical model. You would have them regulated like we do alcohol. So cannabis, for example, you would have that at uh, retail outlets, and but you would have, have it with a health focus. You know, you, you, every single drug is more dangerous because it's banned. 
Yeah. It is the iron law of prohibition that any commodity will be stronger. So if you get it under control, you make it a safer product. It's the same with things like MD MDMA. If you had licensed pharmacies selling MDMA instead of drug dealers, you would have a carefully measured dose. It wouldn't be adulterated with things that are more likely to kill you. And you would hardly ever have an MDMA death because virtually every MDMA death is because the product is not regulated. So it would be better for our youth who want to take MDMA. And I suppose it would also stop children more so getting hold of it, like alcohol. They'd have to get an adult to buy it. Absolutely. It's, it's a, a basic truth in this country and every other country that our teenagers can get hold of cannabis and MDMA far easier than they can alcohol, significantly easier. And we should be protecting them. And, and if people are dubious about this and they want the evidence, well, look at the states in America where they have legalized adult use uh, cannabis. In, in each one of those states, the data is very clear that teenage use has gone down, child mm. use has reduced. I can't get my head around it, though. Um, the, uh, what, am I, what am I doing? I want to go out on a Friday night and I'm with Mark and we think instead of having a few beers, we're going to have some uh, MDMA, ecstasy, cocaine, something like that. What, where do we go to get this? Are we, are we allowed to buy it like we're allowed to go and buy a load of beers or some fags or something? Yes, but I, th I think for commodities like MDMA and uh, cocaine, it's more appropriate to have a licensed pharmacy. I mean, for cannabis, you could have a retail outlet like an off-license. It's, it's much the same way as alcohol. But licensed pharmacies are more the way to go for commodities like MDMA. And you can get advice from somebody who knows. What does that mean? I take a prescription in? No, not a prescription, because if, if you're an adult and you can prove you're old enough to do it or whatever the regulation says as that age needs to be, then you can prove that and go to the uh, chemist. But it may well be that part of that regulation is that they ask you about your, your health at the time and your use. But there are we are advocates of change at LEAP, and that suits us well because we're law enforcement figures. But there are academics who have worked out all the answers to these things. So we work very closely with an, org with an organisation called Transform Drug Policy Foundation. And they've produced a document called Blueprint for Regulation. All the answers are there. They advised the Canadian government on how to regulate um, cannabis. So, you know, the answers are all there. For when the politicians take that brave step, someone has done all this work. What about acid? LSD. Mm. Well, in, there's a brilliant organisation called Drug Science uh, with the wonderful Professor David Nutt. And in 2007, he produced uh, a piece of work called the, it's the Comparators Report or something like that. And basically, he worked out a way of, of comparing the harms of all drugs in a list, both to the person and to society. No great shock that the drug that causes the greatest harm is alcohol. And then at the top, you've got heroin, then cocaine, methamphetamine. And all the way down, right at the bottom, you've got magic mushrooms and LSD. And there's hardly any harms at all. So it sort of makes a lie of the fact that, if, that people believe drugs are banned because of the harms they cause. Mm. But, when, but when you've got the academics looking at what those harms actually are, you know, we should be following the evidence. But though people listening to this will say, you know, we can all drink, so that of course they're going to do us harm because we can all sit there every single night that we can drink. It's a lot harder to go to some scally's house and try and score some... Uh, whatever it is we're going to try and do so so obviously it's not as harmful to you because it's, it's harder to get your hands on it so not as many people do it it's it's easier and quicker to get cocaine in london than pizza delivered to your door is it where do i go now <laughs> i don't actually do drugs but no but, but if, if if you were in the slightest bit interested in doing drugs the slightest it would not take you long to get some numbers really it really really wouldn't and any drug you want you can have it delivered to your door and if you don't want it immediately and you want it delivered to your door in a day or so, then you just go on the dark web. For but, but what about that argument? Because I don't know how to get it. So, you know, I feel naive now, but I don't, really don't know how I'm going to get it. So, so that argument of, the, you know, the, obviously alcohol is more dangerous because more people are doing it and they do it to excess because it's easier to get. As soon as you open up 
the, the, the floodgates to legalize all these drugs. They're going to go, I'm going to go to the pharmacy every day, the drugstore every day, and I'm going to get myself a load of MDMA and sit there and watch narcos, you know, snorting MDMA or whatever. Well, no, al- al- alcohol really is uh, far more um, problematic to the health than, than, really? the, than the other drugs. And the harms of most drugs are actually... Uh, greatest because they're uh, higher because they're prohibited so they would be made safer I and mean, we, we have made alcohol safer it would be even worse if it wasn't regulated mm. you know you used to be able to buy 70 percent proof rum in this country but it was killing people so regulation brought that down to 40 percent that's regulation you can control that if it's a legal product you can do the same with other drugs you can take care of people's health and you can make these things safer no drug use is ever going to be completely safe, but you can significantly reduce the harms. Mm. Um, you mentioned earlier the fact that the uh, the image of all these drugs is is horrendous. Um, what's fascinating about your book is the role the media has to play in all this. Uh, they want to sell papers, so it's such an easy sell to say you know whatever drug it is is killing our children. Isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And this is this is a great frustration because it never seems to end. It seems to be in the world of journalism and media, the one thing that everyone is happy to, to lie about or, or, or talk about with little to no research is drugs. Because a, a drug scare uh, seems to sell newspapers and, and, and attract clicks online. But there is very little truth to almost anything that comes out about drugs. So, for example... The reason that I started getting into a undercover work was because the biggest scare story about drugs had been running in the newspapers for years, and that was about crack cocaine. I remember on the television, uh, Nancy Reagan saying that one smoke of crack cocaine and you're addicted for life. Yeah. I believed that so going into I. the police. <laughs> but, it's, but it's not true. Right. It's not true. Uh, uh, 85% of people who use uh, cocaine or crack have no problem with the drug at all. No addiction at all. And those that do have a problem, it's a sliding scale. So why do people get addicted? Well, people, people get addicted, but it, it's not about the chemical hook. It's not about the drug. 75% of people who use heroin have no problem with, the, with that drug. But the people who do, ha, it's about the problems they have. It's about the disconnection or the childhood trauma. Yes, I've done quite a lot of research on this and I've listened and I've read a lot in your book um, because I knew you were coming on. And basically, uh, people who are suffering from um, sort of uh, addiction problems, they need help. Instead, what we do is we make their lives worse for them by um, sticking them in prison or criminalizing them or making them uh, hang around in, uh, and go and buy horrible uh, drugs cut up off horrible gangsters. And we make their lives worse and perpetrate the addiction. Absolutely. It perpetrates the addiction. It, it reinforces the black mo- the illicit market culture and re-traumatizes people. Mm. Bear in mind that two in five problematic heroin users in this country first tried that drug in prison. And most of those were so- sent to prison for a drug-related offence. Yeah, is it 50% of people in our prisons are um, drug-related in their drug-related crimes? Yes, that's correct. Jesus, so, so you legalise it, you just get rid of that problem, don't you? Like the overcrowding and that, well, you, they'd obviously some of them will move into other crimes because that's what they like doing, but, you know, it would, it would it'd be terrible if you got put in prison for taking drugs. Oh, yeah, hideous. It's, it's, it's terrible. It's just com- compounding trauma. People who are struggling with PTSD and, and other mental illnesses, and they're, they're put in prison. It's literally the worst way of dealing with it. And in America, it's the most, uh, um, the biggest population ever of people been stuck in prison or something, isn't it? Yeah, America has 5% of the world's population, 25% of the world's prison population. They have gone from, from the point that um, Ronald Reagan uh, reiterated and reinforced the idea that, of the war on drugs, um, they had 220 thousand people in prison now it's over 2.2 million do you think as humans we should be taking drugs do you think it's part of our makeup to do it it's completely natural it is a natural way uh, it's a natural behavior of humans and ha- has done right through ancient history i was reading just today about an archeological dig um of vikings in the northeast 
um, indications that they used cannabis. Um, that, that it goes back people using opium, um, whatever whatever part of ancient history or history you study, humans have used drugs. Uh, Queen Victoria uh, used opium uh, and cannabis at her time of the month because she found it eased her pains particularly. And later in life, she was introduced to cocaine and very much enjoyed it. She didn't have a problem with it. They kept the quantities quite mild, didn't they? That's regulation for you. Yeah, which is... Th- it's weird, actually, because I was talking to Mark before we came on, and I said to Mark, because I, I just don't do it, and I was thinking, I, I kind of, after reading your book, think, maybe I should have been doing all these drugs. I don't really want to, because I don't know what they're cut up with and all that sort of stuff, but maybe that's what we should have been doing, taking... Because when you go to the hospital, and I've had a couple of operations, and, and you come out and you're on morphine, it's like, wow, that feels really good. <laughs> And you think, if someone's to give me morphine, maybe, you know, once a month, I'd probably go, yeah, I'll take a bit of that, because it's quite a nice feeling. Yeah, but it, it would need to be safely regulated, and you'd need to know exactly what you were doing. Exactly. So education goes alongside it. I mean, I personally would, it wouldn't matter whether that was available or not. I, I would never try morphine recreationally or heroin. And I, you'd probably find that al- almost every listener is going to say the same thing. So, yeah. you know, that epidemic that people fear, you, well, you have to think, well, would I do it? I, actually, no, I wouldn't. Well, have you, well, in your career, have you had to take uh, lots of drugs? You must have had to do a bit of coke or something, haven't you, when you're being undercover copper? Oh, uh, not, not, uh, not very often, actually. I was uh, good at talking my way out of it or, or instilling trust in people so they didn't question me. But I once made the mistake of... Uh, big mistake of making out myself as a connoisseur of amphetamines and this particular gangster one day brought me this he said hey, okay you i've got you a present and he brought me this little sealy bag yeah. this toxic looking pink goo in it and he said uh, you're gonna want that and he picked up on my, my reticence so i knew i had to have some oh that was horrific it really was it, I, I had a little bit, and he says, no, you're going to want more than that with your tolerance, aren't you? <laughs> I thought, great. So a bit, 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 bit more in, I could almost feel the mouth also forming in my mouth as I had it, and then the feeling in my stomach. I didn't sleep properly for three nights. It was horrific, because oh, wow. I'd had so much. You know, um, Amphetamine at the time was 5, 5% pure normally. This was 40% pure. Wow. Yeah, so I was awake for a long time. Mind you, my house has never been so tidy. <laughs> It's quite nice that we can laugh at it, isn't it? In a way, um, the the I, I just want to quickly just backtrack a bit to the press because in your book there's been various. Actually, every decade the press have come in and yeah. absolutely demonised drugs and drug takers and people who want to take drugs. Never people who are who are drinking alcohol though, and maybe a bit of binge drinking. I suppose they're doing that now actually in the papers, but they've, they've, they've always done it. And it's had such a big impact on my parents and all our parents and our grandparents and now us. And now we look at our children and go, oh, don't take, don't take it. It's all, it's all terrible stuff and everything else. It, they've had such a huge impact on this, haven't they, and the world? Yeah, they really, really have. And, and it wasn't the media or police that called this a war on drugs. It was politicians. And if it, if it is a war, which I believe it is, then misinformation is propaganda. So the media have, and journalists have, ta- have played a huge role in that. I mean, perhaps one of the most disgraceful was when um, Acid House started, for example. And there were, ju- there were uh, journalists from The Mirror and The Sun, for example, jokingly competing with each other at what ridiculous stories they could create. And they were just making them up. You know, the, the person who jumped out of a, a skyscraper or, or one ridiculous story about, um, that suggested that drugs were being wrapped in silver foil and, and, and spread across a party for people to pick up from, from a fan in the ceiling and things like this. Just ridiculous things that just weren't true. I was talking to you earlier about that when you came in about the, the acid house scene. That was in my clubbing days and it was sort of all lots of rare groove and then suddenly acid house came along and, um, and the, the rise of ecstasy and trips and stuff and the music and everyone going out to dance. It was all really good fun. It was, um, you know, it, it was interesting. And I said to you, after about a year or so, it started, I found it started getting dark 
And it's so funny reading your book because I understood why I started thinking it got dark because suddenly there was a lot of money in it. Yeah. And a lot of the criminals were coming to these clubs and where it all started with everybody sort of, yeah, it just sort of like, yeah, this is so happy and we're up and we're raving and all this sort of stuff. Suddenly it, it, it turned into, you could look around the room and see clusters of gangsters knocking around. And then, and then the drug dealers became really prominent in all the clubs. Everyone knew who the drug dealers were. Uh, because in your book you you point out that, that they always do a deal with the doorman. Mm. That that's how it works. And suddenly I started. One day I saw a gun and I was like, Jesus Christ! There's a gun in a club, you know. And to me that was horrific and so scary. And you were hearing about all these gangster stories and everything. And and obviously people start moving into selling it and all that sort of stuff. It becomes very dark very quickly, doesn't it? When it's when it's made illegal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, I, I actually I really love the dance music culture and the, what Britain did with it. I think it's an amazing thing, but you, you cannot separate it from the drug culture, the influence of, of what people were taking that influenced the music. And that could be a, a delightful thing. You know, it's, 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 it's a, a movement of, uh, of culture. But as you say, because of the illicit market, it gets dark very, very quickly, and the violence only increases year after year. And, you know, it didn't, didn't take too long for actually... Uh, the doorman, because it, it was always a deal. The, de- the dealers would make a deal with the doorman to keep other dealers out and let them have a free reign in the club. But of course, it didn't take too long for the doorman to think, hang on a minute here, I'm only taking a cut here. I want that business. Right. So then you've got um, security firms and the door staff actually making the step into organised crime. And a lot of those door staff, the security, the, the, the bigger firms, they have ex-military you know, sudden, and suddenly you've got a, an organi- a, an, a carefully organised, slightly military influence to organised crime. And yeah, that's when it starts getting dark. Okay, let's talk about your career in it then. So if you're a copper, you're joining the police. What, what year did you join in? 1989. 89, you're joining it. Um, and uh, rock and roll bit of the police is the drug squad. Is that correct? That's what sort of Peter Blexley always says. It's, it's, it's sort of, it's where you want to be, yeah? Yeah, it is. Yeah, especially in the early early nineties, all all of the money was going into the drug squad. Uh, they were the only people who got the overtime. They were the people who had the flash cars, the fancy equipment, the military encrypted radios. They wore whatever clothes they wanted, and and you know every detective wanted to to be on the squad. It was it was the prime place to be. So your job was to dress up, uh, get yourself in there in the drug squ- in the drug gangs, and then try and infiltrate them and bring them down. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, I start from the bottom. You know, my, my the kind of undercover work I did was much was a lower level and much grimier than actually Peter Blexley did. Uh, but th- but that would be my plan. Yeah, six it would be six months, and I would gather evidence of conspiracy against an organised crime group who were running the supply in the streets. Absolutely terrifying, is it? it yeah, well, it certainly had its moments. Yeah, I've had a, a samurai sword to my throat, knives to my groin, and someone's tried to kill me with a car and. Yeah, it had its moments. Why would you sure. do it? Well, I mean, I, 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 I believed in doing the right thing. You know, I, I believed in that if I was taking a risk, I was doing it for the greater good. You know, I was a, a dutiful young man who who uh, who, who believed in, in in doing the right thing. Really, it was. I was fighting the good fight, shall I say? I was fighting according to my principles. Is it all wasted time now then? Well, it's worse than that. It's worse than a waste of time. It's far worse. Futility would be bad enough. But no, this is causing massive damage, massive damage to our society, both nationally and internationally. OK, so this is the this is the bit that got me. I don't know, really sort of made me feel sent chills down me when you start talking about all the bent coppers. Uh, I don't know if that's the right phrase, but we'll use that because people don't understand it. Um, obviously it doesn't take long for the drug gangs. I, when I spoke to Peter Blexley, I said, didn't the drug gangs just sit outside um, Scotland Yard waiting for you to come out? And he went, yep, <laughs> he used to watch us everywhere. But then it doesn't take long before they actually put, put um, uh, uh, policemen into the police force. Employ, they're employing them to go in there and they're paying off policemen because there's so much money around. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I came very close to corruption. It, it almost... It, possibly almost got me killed. Um, I, I did an operation in Nottingham where the, the gang I was trying to get information on, I, I've been doing it for about four and a half months and uh, 
two of my backup team went off sick. So I was introduced to these two new chaps. Shook the hand of one of them. No problem. Shook the hand of the second one. And the hairs went up on the back of my neck. Just the, my, instinctively, there was something that screamed wrong about this guy. But when you've been working the streets for four and a half months, you, your perceptions are fairly fine-tuned and you're feeling a bit paranoid. Uh, so I said to the boss, I've got to exclude this guy. And he said, fine. I'm glad that my, my perceptions were, were there because it turned out he was an employee of the gangsters I was trying to find information about. I was trying to infiltrate them. He'd infiltrated us. By the time I met by the time I met him, he'd been in the police for seven years. He was employed by the gangster to join the police. Jesus. So in the debrief for that, I met senior police and they said to me universally, Woodsy, of course this happens. With this much money involved, how can it not happen? So I have to make this absolutely clear to anyone who's got any doubt. The only thing that can pay for that level of corruption is the money from the illicit drugs market. There is no other form of criminality can cause that corruption. Nothing. Now, I've come across it, this corruption, but when we interviewed Frank Matthews for Drug Wars, even I was stunned at the extent of it from his point of view and the, de- the detail that he gives us. Well, you've read it. Yeah, I've read it. It's, it that's it's, the bit which it's just, incredible. I, just, I found absolutely incredible. Yeah. It's, it's like the police of the gangsters. The, you, you can't see the difference between the, the guys he's talking about and the, and the gang. They are the same thing. And we're, this is Britain, yeah. where we think we have law and order here. And, and then you've got this stuff going on. I mean, I was absolutely shocked by it. Yeah, it's incredible. And, you know, he, he dealt with the higher echelons of organized crime in his investigatory work. And, of course, he was an enemy of them. But it's, it, it's very telling that he actually only found only thought his life was genuinely at risk when his colleagues were looking at him he was more scared of his of the police than the than the gangsters it's it is it's horrifying and and i think we're very privileged to have got frank's story in the book yeah it's an incredible story um when you read through and that and that that sort of was the bit that when I had to uh, message you saying, holy shit, this is unbelievable. Um, th- we need to legalize drugs right now because we need to... Because in a way, you sort of feel sorry for the policemen put in this position because they are also put in a position where they're offered a lot of money, probably. They've probably ended up with a partner who goes, just do a bit of this and a bit of that, you know, makes our life easy. There's so many blurred lines when you're in the drug squad I assume, between what you should be doing and what you should be not doing with your informants and everything else. It just seems such a mess that you end up on the wrong side. And once you're on the wrong side, that's it. Boom. You're, you're, you're now owned by them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, OK, perhaps we should say, you know, the vast, vast majority of police are not corrupt in the slightest. Yeah. But it doesn't matter because there's always going to be enough corrupted for the whole system to be tainted and, and, and you, you the power of drugs organized crime is is incredible and the reach of them but it's not necessarily people who have been corrupted by the money that's available to them while they're in the job of course they they are there but it's the moles who are recruited to join the police and the prison service as well and all of the institutions organized crime know what they're doing they know how to bring control this system and if you legalise it, will it die overnight, do you think? Well, yes. It, Corruption, it, it, I mean, in the police force. Corru- yeah, because it's not just that there's the value of money. It's, it could only come from the illicit drug supply. But also, the fact that we police drugs mm. thins, it thins out the people dealing and creates monopolies. So you get rid of the low-hanging fruit, the big people... They, they love the police, the big, the most successful gangsters, because we take out their competition for them. They even actually use informants to take out the competition. So what that means is over time, the monopolies have a bigger share of the, of the pie, which means it's more able for them to corrupt the system because they have so much of the money. Now, even if you had a, a, an illicit market for, the drugs, for drugs of 10% after legalisation, and I think it's possible to get it well below that. But even if you had, if there was still an illicit market of ten percent, that's still a win, because that's not enough money to corrupt the system. If you're going to the pharmacy and they're charging you, uh, I don't know, you're going to get some MDMA and they're charging you ten quid, 
and some fella down the road's going to undercut it for five quid. Doesn't that keep the market going? Well, price is a very important regulatory tool. And you would have to get that right with an emphasis on getting rid of the illicit market. You have to see, in, ter- in policy terms, you have to see getting rid of the illicit market as a primary concern. So pricing becomes important. In Uruguay, for example, where they've legally regulated cannabis, pricing was the biggest concern because that was they wanted to get m- money away from organised crime. So it's, it's very cheap in Uruguay. I think it's a dollar a gram or something like that. Yeah, well, you have to do that. Otherwise, the market's still there, isn't it? Cheaper and, and, you know, they just cut it up, make it cheaper. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and also, I mean, you do have to have a health focus. You have mm. to make the, sure that the commodities are healthier for people. But having said that, in the, in the case of cannabis, you still have to have choice because there is always going to be a minority of people uh, for particular health concerns, for example, mm. who require a high THC, strong cannabis. So choice is also important. If you're still not convinced, by the way, um, this I'm talking to our listeners here, uh, then I had Ross Kemp on my show this week, and he's doing a documentary about how the police now want guns because there's AK-47s on the street and all sorts of stuff. Um, And Ross is not saying that we should have them and the police don't want them, but they're saying, look, we're going up against guns and we've got got pepper spray, (laughs) which seems mad. However, on reading your book, the guns are on the streets, it seems, pretty much due to the drug industry. Entirely. Entirely, Entirely would you say? Entirely, I would say. As, as when I talked about those three gangsters from Liverpool, you can see the clear cause and effect there. The arming of organised crime has come in response to drugs policing. It's come in response to prohibition. There was no drive at all to have weapons. So the way it works is someone comes and I'm a drug dealer. Someone comes and tries to steal drugs off me. Um, <clears throat> I can't go to the police because I'm selling drugs. Yeah. So the only way to protect myself is by going, I'm going to hurt you. Um, and then I think, well, I might as well get a gun because that's the thing which will hurt most people around here. And then they think, well, he's got a gun, so I'll get a gun. Is this, is this the right thing? Am I on the right tracks here? Absolutely, yeah. And then Absolutely. they think, well, he's got a gun, but I've got an AK-47. I can fire multiple rounds. And then I could have got a grenade. And then, you know, I'm going to speak to North Korea and get a nuclear war. <laughs> so basically, it just keeps going, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It does. Uh, and so that escalation is caused by policing. But there is, there is other forms of escalation um, which are happening as a result of prohibition as well. And this, this one's really important. County lines... The exploitation of children who are now dealing drugs. This is the tip of the iceberg. This is only just beginning. It will get far, far worse. And I have to say, that's my fault as well. It's my fault or people like me. Because county lines is the natural tactical response to police success. This is what police success looks like. It's a natural strategic response because... I, I, the one operation I did... Sorry, what's county lines? County lines is when uh, children are exploited by organised crime to transport and sell drugs. Right. So, say, a gang from Birmingham, they yeah. want to expand their operations, so they'll use a 15-year-old. They say they want a drug deal in Western Supermare, uh, and Birmingham gangs do deal there. They'll send a child, they'll send a 15-year-old down there. They'll establish them in a, in a house uh, of a vulnerable person... And they'll give them two weeks' supply, and they're supplying drugs for that gang. This is happening all the time around the, the UK now, and it's expanding. The reason that's happened is because of the way we police drugs, or the fact that we do police drugs. For one operation, uh, I took out a Birmingham gang that was taking over the drug supply in Northampton, but they were doing that themselves. The natural tactical response to the su- kind of success that I had is to use children because they're a buffer zone between the police and the gangsters. They're easily manipulated. They're disposable. This is a creation of our drug policy. So every time we see a story about these children being exploited, we have to face up to the fact that it's our policy which has caused this situation. How close are you getting to to getting this, then, do we think? How close are you getting to... You've mentioned some politicians who are engaging with you. Um, I, I mean, our Prime Minister, she's never going to go for it, is she? 
Well, no, I mean, I think she's quite clearly uh, a moralizer. And moralizing judgment really is the is really is the enemy of good drug policy because we should be just going with the evidence. It's not too much to ask. Haven't they legalized it in Switzerland? It's worked. Well, uh, Switzerland uh, they in, they prescribe injectable heroin. They they prescribe heroin to problematic heroin users. They did that in 1994, but they used British evidence to do it. <laughs> They used our own evidence. And, na- and now, uh, at LEAP, we're using Swiss evidence to try and convince politicians in this country that we, that's the way we need to go. But we are, we are getting there with that. Are, are you getting close to, close to um, the inner circles of the government? I mean, are, are they listening? Or are they, is, it just, is, it like, is it the same as saying, I want to do something to the NHS, where they go, I'm not touching it because I'm not going to get any votes? Well, I mean... I, I think it's fair enough where politicians uh, go where the votes are, to a degree. But there are some really good politicians showing really good leadership at the moment. But, and, and I'll mention a few, so Crispin Blunt from the Conservatives, yeah. for example, Thangam Debonair, Jeff Smith, um, Ronnie Cowan in Scotland, um, Arvon Jones from, from Wales, and there are lots more. But politicians are not the important ones here. It's us. It's us, yeah. Yeah, but I listened to Bob Nutt. Is it Bob Nutt, that guy you said? What was his name? The Dave, David Nutt. David Nutt. David I, li- Nutt. I listened to him years ago and thought, yeah, this guy's talking sense. And everyone hated him and said, and they got rid of him from government, didn't they? Wasn't he? A, wasn't he, he was sacked as chair of the ACMD, the advisory group, which advises the, the government on drug policy. Yeah. He was sacked. So I thought, well, obviously they know more. Right, stupidly, brainwashed into it. I've read all the headlines, so obviously I think every drug's killing my children. Um, and then, and then, and then Peter Blexy comes on here and starts talking about legalizing drugs. I think, wow, he's going out on a limb on my podcast. That's what I genuinely thought. The guy's going out on a limb. Now I've read up on it and looked into it. It's not going out on a limb at all. It's the most sensible thing ever yeah. to do it. But every time I mention it to any one of my friends and I say, I've got you coming on to tell us about legalizing drugs, they go, what? You can't do that. We are so far. We've been so brainwashed for so many years. Yeah, we have. We have been brainwashed, not just by the media as well. If you consider what the police do, the police are playing a role in this, and this has to change. So say your police arrest a burglar. Yeah. Burglaries will go down because there's a, there's a very tiny number of people who will commit burglary. So yeah. the demand for that crime has gone down. If you arrest a drug dealer, you've got a crime recorded, then you've got all the other crimes that are not recorded because someone else has taken their place. Yeah. But the police put out on social media in the news, oh, look how successful we are. Look at that ton of cocaine we've seized look at all this cannabis we've seized it gives the impression to the public that the police are making the streets safer by arrest by doing these things and it's not true it's not true that's actually misinformation and the police need to face up to that and change because that is preventing the general public coming to the logical conclusions with the evidence because the evidence the the, the truth is being how much of police time is taken up with drugs then well it's huge and it's some if you were to ask me this in uh, 2016, uh, there was some information that, that it's the biggest bill in policing. There is more spent on drug policy than any other topic, any other thing. That's possibly not the case now, but it's certainly one of the biggest. Um, I think the figure I got uh, from a Freedom of Information request is uh, £7 billion a year police spend on it, on drug policy. Uh, the National Crime Agency suggested that it costs... 10.7 billion to police it overall. So huge figures, essentially. And all of that money would be best spent taking care of people. Well, what scares me most after reading your book is I'm walking down streets all day long. There's drug dealers all around me who are violent because they're having to get more violent. They're everywhere now because that's the nature of the business. We're creating more drug dealers all the time. Absolutely. And they're getting stronger and tougher and they turn we're basically going to turn into um el chapo and all that lot aren't we and uh, uh they those guys who just who just are, they're ruthless our guys are the same are they yeah absolutely and we're only going in one direction i'll tell you about a 16 year old i met uh, in leicester he went by the nickname of ab and he was part of this gang who was dealing heroin i'd I'd, I'd buy enough all of them and actually he was really likable he was a cheeky kid he was a likable 16 year old six months later he was a terrifying 17-year-old because he had to adopt a different way of behaving to become part of his team ethos because that's how they stayed safe. That's how they made sure people didn't grasp them up. That's how they protected their territory. There was no way as a 15-year-old he was thinking he was going to grow up to be a violent drug dealer. I'm sure he had other ambitions. 
But I saw that change happen. And what's happening is drug prohibition is changing the personality of our young men. And that is, is, is a, is going to, it's only going in one direction. Is knife crime, the, the, the huge amount of knife crime we've got going on in, in London, I'm not sure how much it's, I, I, I'm very aware of it in London because I read it every day on the news or every week on the news. Is that connected? It's absolutely, it's fundamentally about that. Even where knife crime is not related directly for drug dealing, it's still the backdrop, it's still the wallpaper, it's still the influence that's making peer groups be competitively violent. As I've explained about AB in Leicester, that person, yeah. I've seen lots of people like that. There is, there is no greater influence on violent behaviour than the illicit drugs market. Mm. And what was the interesting thing about your book, if we quickly, uh, just quickly run through the decades, the 60s was um, taking pills, amphetamines, yeah, that's yeah. what they were, yeah. They took pills and then the papers said they were, oh, there was, actually, you, you sort of get it down to one guy, don't you, who, ba- yeah. who basically ruined it by getting involved with a journalist. Lee Harris, yeah, the lovely Lee Harris, lovely bloke. Interviewed and, him in the book, yeah. Yeah, but he basically started the modern drug war in Britain, essentially. Mm. yeah. And he regrets it, and he's been working hard to, to combat that. So, so the, 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 the pill scene in the mods was uh, basically just a very small scene in Soho. Um, but because some of the kids were taking too many, you know, the, the press picked up on it, and then it suddenly they had to do something about it. Um, we then move on to the 70s where the heroin, am I right here? The 70s was trips and heroin? Yeah, essentially. I mean, heroin, it took 10 years for people to take notice of how huge heroin had become. But, you know, as soon as heroin was gifted to organised crime, then that's, that was where the disaster was seeded. And, of course, uh, LSD. Um, I, I'm not sure you could describe LSD as being a problem. Um, a collection mm. of people sitting in a field listening to music and that kind of scene. It's, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see the great, great issue there. But, of course, um, the police hunted it and in Operation Julie which we which we cover in the book is a fascinating undercover operation where uh, millions of doses of trips were were, were discovered mm. and and heroin sort of became huge when uh poverty and unemployment hit and people were miserable and then heroin came into their lives yeah absolutely I'm, I mean I've, I've made the point that uh, the majority of people who have a problem with heroin are trying to deal with some kind of childhood trauma but childhood trauma can be compounded by other things. And I think it's quite telling that the, the areas of the UK which were, most, which were hit the most badly by the heroin explosion is the places of industrial decline, and in particular the former mining areas. Right. So then we move on to the 80s, and um, towards the uh, late 80s, <clears throat> that's when suddenly drugs become part of British culture. Yes. With the party scene. A couple of, yeah, a load of guys went off to Ibiza, bought the music back, and with it came drugs. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it is, it <coughs> is uh, and it really is the drugs that, that fueled that entire scene. But that's when the majority of, not majority, sorry, but a large, a much bigger p- 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 portion of Britons became um, criminals because they all were doing illegal drugs. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and, it's the case now, you know, at some weekends uh, in the summer in the UK, there might be a million people take MDMA each weekend and they're all criminals because we've, we've made them criminals as a society. So, so that's, that's, that changed the landscape a lot because with so many people taking drugs, there was more demand. And so I imagine the crime it fueled the gangs massively. They, they had to up their scales uh, significantly, did they? Absolutely. I mean, the, the money really was increasing exponentially. It increased the amount of value in the market, increased every year. And so organised crime just grew massively. Where is it all made? Well, it depends on the drug. I mean, uh, traditionally, MDMA, all, 90% of the MDMA in the UK is made in Holland. Um, is uh, it illegal in Holland? Uh, yes. But the organised crime groups that manufactured it, they've just they've existed there. A lot of the amphetamine is also made in Holland traditionally. Um, obviously, cocaine comes from South America. Heroin, ninety percent of the heroin comes from Afghanistan. Um, traditional cannabis, which we used to have in this country, used to come from Morocco or, or some from India. And now the UK is a net exporter of cannabis. We grow all our own legally. 
illy. Well, actually, both. <laughs> both, actually. If you look at the illicit market, um, uh. the, the organized crime is so successful at, at growing cannabis in this country um, that, that there is some evidence that we actually export, that, export it to where, other countries. Where are we growing it? Uh, houses in the country, houses in the city, dif- different factories and all over the place, really. There's, um, there are two, uh, there are at least two cannabis factories for every serving police officer in the UK. Really? Yeah. God, it's so naive. And as soon as, as soon as one is shut down, another one, another one crops up. How long does it take? And that that takes a lot of policing hours. How long does it take to grow that stuff then? Is it a quick grow? Depends on the strain. Um, but some strains will, will be ready in, uh, sort of 10 weeks. Oh even, wow! Even, and and that obviously they are. There's a developing of the strains to get the shorter amount as well, shorter amount of time. And and I I was told that some will actually be ready in eight and eight and nine weeks. So are there many factories for making ecstasy and stuff over here, or is there, is there big factories doing that? Quite or? possibly, um, right. but most mostly it's imported. Right. So does Holland, South America, Morocco, or these places, Af- Afghanistan, do all the heroin? Is that what you said? Where did you say heroin comes from? Her- heroin. Ninety percent of the heroin in this country comes from Afghanistan. I think they've actually got ninety percent of the world's production. Actually, do all these people want drugs legalized so they can try and turn their uh, try and make it legal in their country so they can actually de- get some tax off it and change their... Oh, no, no. International cartels want the status quo. But, but the it... governments in these countries, does not the does Holland not think, Christ, if everyone legalises this stuff, we can make some money? Well, possibly, but the trouble I suppose is... we'd make our own over here, though, would we? Is that what, is well, that what you think? Well, we might be able to, but, I mean, the, the problem is the American influence has been almost complete around the world, and we are fighting against that decades and decades of influence in each individual state um there are there are treaty difficulties as well because the american-led treaty which forced everyone to sign up to prohibition um there are um inbuilt sanctions built into that treaty so theoretically canada could be sanctioned by the united nations because they've legalized cannabis they're not going to be sanctioned because the usa have gone first bizarrely but the U.S., but there is international pressure and politics to get around. There have been politicians from Mexico who who uh, who want to legally regulate. Are they but, killed? Or, or they were um, set up and uh, with fraud suggestions and things like that. They were they were um, taken out, taken out one way or another. Yeah. So, but the, there's so much money in the illicit market that it's, it's literally dangerous in some countries for politicians to speak out. Mm. What, is the, what is the drug future now? I, I, I read, I hear about meow, meow and ice and all this sort of stuff. What, what's going on there? What's happening in the, the, the future of it then or, or where we're at now? Well, there will always be um, cultural shifts and trends and fashions with, with drug taking. Um, for example, MDMA really is hand in hand with dance music. Because people like to dance, if they like to dance with the, with the effector of it. Um, but th- I mean, but things like Meow Meow, which you're referring to Mephidrone, 4MMC. Um, the interesting thing about that, when it was available in 2009, 2010, is the only year on record that cocaine deaths went down. Because it's a similar dopamine stimulant that people could get and liked, and it's significantly safer than cocaine. So that's, that's the only influence. So... All of our policing didn't have any impact on the cocaine deaths, but a different drug being available did. Amazing, isn't it? So we just have to look at the evidence. We just we have to carefully regulate. And actually, in the UK, we're brilliant at regulation. We're really good at regulating our food and our uh, um, other things that keep us safe. So we just need to look at the evidence. So how big's Leap UK? Is it is it building? You can follow Leap UK, by the way, on Twitter. I've started following it to, to listen to it. It's just at, at Leap UK, isn't at, it? At yeah. UK Leap. Oh, yes. at UK Leap. Okay. Um, uh, how, how big is it over here? Well, we've got uh, around 50 members. We're going to be announcing lots of new members. Peter Blexley is um, is is a great one to be, to be joining us. Um, well, but we have former chief constables, former MI5, quite a few other under, former other Kundo cops that did the same kind of work that I did. Um, but we're growing across the world. Um, as I say, late, later this year we launch in uh, France, 
uh, we've there's uh, Germany have about 60 members. Scandinavia, the, Scandinavia is interesting because in Norway they have I think about 34 members, but half of them are serving police. So the chairman, wow, the chairman of Leap in Scandinavia is the head of a uh, serious crime investigation in Oslo. That's so, fantastic news, and, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's only in the last 12 months. And in the USA, um, it, it's grown hugely. It, they have um, chiefs of police and sheriffs serving ser- sheriffs in, in the organisation as well. What's your prediction then? How long before? What next for you? And what's your prediction? How long before these, this stuff is legalised? Well, cannabis, I think, will be soon. Um, soon as in years, five years, ten years? What's soon? Well, however long it takes to get the evidence from Canada, and I think we will have good evidence from Canada within 12 months, okay. certainly about the decrease in youth access to the, to the drug, which is what politicians will be looking at right. here. Um, it, it will only take a shift in the regime and the Conservative Party to have people supportive of it in that party. It's quite possible to have the same thing in, in Labour and the other parties. So... That, and there's and certainly recent polling actually from Voltfass suggests that over half of the population uh, supports some kind of cannabis reform, either decriminalisation or regulation. What about the other stuff? The other stuff we've got work to do. Heroin is the most important thing. It's killing the most people. It causes the. It's got the most crime associated with it, and it's got the most child exploitation associated with it. And heroin, there is movement right now. Uh, there is soon to be heroin prescribing up in Middlesbrough. There's going to be heroin prescribing in uh, the West Midlands, both supported by the police and crime commissioners, actually, mm. and their partners in, in the whole scheme. There will be evidence from that about the reduction in crime. As for the drugs in between, we, we, we just have to keep getting, the, getting this out there. We, we, things can change very, very quickly, I think, in public opinion, and we're, we are on the cusp of a societal awakening on this issue. And... And part of that, I think, is, 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 is we've just got to put some more work in from the from Leap. I'm just so worried because I'm so brainwashed. As I said to you earlier, it's like I, the, the idea of legalising drugs was just so alien to me. And that, But, you know, I, I've been converted because I listen and I've interviewed Peter Pilexi. Hopefully listeners to this will, will read your book, um, Drug Wars, and make up their own mind. But if you read that and still think <laughs> drugs being illegal is a good idea... You'd be nuts. Right. Um, I, everyone who comes to my podcast, I ask the, the same questions. So I'm going to ask you, what one piece of advice would you like to give our listeners that has been invaluable to your life, Neil? Um, stay true to your core values. Um, because if you, you, I know you've got a second question that this relates to as well, haven't you? Wow. Um, because I, I made it, I, the biggest mistake I've made. All right, that's the next question. What's the biggest mistake you've made? Yeah. The biggest mistake I've made is behaving contrary to my core values. Now, okay, I did that as a job as a police officer, but I was causing harm to individuals. I was, and I consciously decided to do that. I could, I could hide behind the I was only following orders, but what I was doing was actually contrary to my core values. So, and I suffer now from post traumatic stress disorder. And moral injury, you know, diagnosed with a psychiatrist, I received counselling. Um, and part of that is because I breached my core values. See, I, that's what I worry about with some of these uh, amusing expression again, bent coppers. I reckon some of them are just not strong enough to go, no, I don't want to get involved. You know, there's money there, there's pressure from a partner, there's pressure from the gangs or whatever. They've, they've got involved with the informants, which is all described in your book. I'm not, I'm not sort of explaining that very well, but, but they start relationships with informants and then the relationship at one stage flips and the informant becomes more powerful than the police. And they end up in these sort of... And I think a lot of the time that's, that's, that must happen to them. And they, then they end up in this horrific world where they're going... I've joined the police force to be a good person and now I'm on the wrong side. Yeah, absolutely. But, but that, that's how I felt. Did that, you? I, I, that I was, on, I was on the wrong side eventually. Um, I, I had to leave. I had to leave the police. Um, because I, I was causing harm, you know, and, I, and when you see very clearly what the harm this is causing, but I'm, what, I'm what, duty bound to change. But what do you mean you were actually yourself causing harm? I was part of an institution, and I mean, I tried to change things within for a while and persuade yeah. people, um, but but it, it it wasn't doing enough because, and over time, the harm that I've caused to certain individuals it, it's caused me psychological harm. 
And so I couldn't continue in the police. What well, you mean your actions have actually hurt people? Yes, absolutely. But just imprisonment or? There's one person, for example, who, um, who I manipulated over the space of months. And I used to manipulate vulnerable people. I'd pick on the vulnerable people because they're easiest to manipulate. Oh, I see. This, this, that's that's yeah. the skills of okay. undercover policing. Yeah, this yeah. Is the, if, you know, if you support uh, drug prohibition, this is the yeah. tactics you're supporting. And, you know, you're talking about um, problematic heroin users are trying to struggle with an abusive parent or the memories of an abusive parent or sexual abuse as a child. And they're using heroin to cope with that. And along comes an undercover cop who's, who's really good at manipulating people. That's why they do that job. And, you know, and, it, and it's causing harm to them. They need help and you just get further trauma. So, the, for example, I had one in, in, who was in the, uh, in the cell he was arrested. He yeah. was the person who had introduced me to all sorts of gangsters. He was committing offences on bail, so he got arrested as well. And he ended up being on suicide watch. Right. Because as he told the, the cops there, he thought I was his best friend. Because I was the person who listened to him and understood him. And I did. Because I used empathy, that's why I was good at it. But what I did is I weaponized empathy. And that person was, ended up suicidal as a result. But that's not your fault, Neil. Well, it is your fault, but it's not your fault because you were doing what your job entailed. So, and you went in there to do the right thing for the. You, you, I mean, I know you are beating yourself up about it, probably because you've got PTSD, but you shouldn't be, should you? But you see, for, and, um, I justified that to myself at the time. I took that as an ethical decision. Yeah, that I was causing harm for the greater good. Yeah, and but but the reality is, I did breach my core values. Well, that's one of the most powerful pieces of advice ever. Thanks for that. Um, that's, 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 wow. Any life hacks? Sorry, I went a bit quiet there because that's actually, I've just, this really hit me that. It's, just, it's, you know, it's actually a very honest thing to say. And it's like, wow, I'm actually affecting somebody else's life. I wonder. It's a big thing. Um, any life hacks? Breathe with your diaphragm. Oh. Breathe with your diaphragm. Um, You'll probably know this because you, you get that s sudden burst of adrenaline. You need to go in front of a camera or something like that. You'll find that you breathe in the top of your lungs. Yeah. So whether you're up working undercover or whether you've got a job interview <laughs> or, or you're about to go on telly, whatever it is, be aware of your diaphragm. Breathe with your diaphragm and you will become more relaxed physiologically. It, you know, people study doing this in, in yoga and the right breathing technique yeah. or for singing techniques, pendulum breathing, yeah. all of these kind of things. But you can break it down to a very simple thing. Breathe with your diaphragm. Perfect. Uh, was there any situations where you were thinking you're going to give yourself away by dilating eyes and, and sweaty palms and breathing heavily because you were nervous and scared in situations? Yeah, absolutely. And that's always a risk. So to be in control of yourself right. um, is a very important thing. The last thing you want to do is your shoulders going up and down because you're breathing on the top of your lungs. You know, it tends to make people a little bit suspicious. Of and it doesn't help. You know, it doesn't help concentration. Can you recommend a book? The next book I'm going to read, by the way, I've got to read uh, Giles Brandreth's book. Um, but then after that, I'm going to read uh, Good Cop. I, I imagine your book and Giles haven't got a lot of common. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a bit, it's a bit different. But Good Cop, Bad, Bad War, I'll read, which is your book all about your life, which I'll, which I'll read. Um, uh, but any other books that you can recommend? Well, uh, I think you mentioned it earlier on, actually, or certainly the person, Johan Hari. Johan Hari is a good friend of mine, and he is a, an incredibly important figure in the, internationally for drug law reform. And that's because of his book, Chasing the Scream. And I would say that's his essential reading. Okay, he's coming on this podcast. In is a, he? Yeah, yeah, in a few few weeks he's oh, coming he's, on. Oh, he's yeah. brilliant. He's yeah, really when brilliant. he gets back, he's doing the tour of America at the moment, isn't he, promoting his wares. He's got a, a great book on depression as well, which really yes. interests me. Yeah, it is, it is brilliant. He's got but, to the bottom of that. So. But for me, I mean, he's a hero to me for, his, for, his, for chasing the screen. Oh, brilliant. Well, that's fantastic news. Um, and uh, final question, what is the meaning of life? Uh, oh. I'm, I've been trying to think, when I was walking here, I was trying to think, what, what on earth do I answer to that? <laughs> it's a really difficult question. And, and I, I, I'm, am I the first one to say 42? No, I won't, I won't, <laughs> I won't, I won't, go, I won't go Douglas Adams. Um, oh, I don't know. I, 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 I suppose knowing who you are, knowing to be able to say I know who I am, I think, 
is the best I'm going to do with that one. Um, I have some blind spots because of my mental illness, but uh, I think I know who I am, and I think that's important. When you were undercover, did you become the person you were? Was it hard to distinguish the difference between who you are and the person you were pretending to be? Yeah, I think it's it's made things more confused for me in the fact that I was acting out roles. But as an undercover cop, you're not an actor. You have to play a different version of yourself. Mm. And I think that's important because if you try and act too much, you can't maintain it for days on end or months mm. on end. Um, and behaving differently and behaving with different values, it, it does, it stretches you. And, um, and so so for me... I think that the most um, calm and collected and good people tend to be people who know who they are. They, they know how they will react to something, whatever mm. it is. They know that they're always going to take the choice to do the right thing. Uh, Nobel invented dynamite, you know, but um, he's best known for the Peace Prize. Yeah. So, um, you know, you did your stuff where you thought you, uh, uh, you know, maybe affected people's lives. However, you're going to be best known for the the fighting the war on drugs, trying to legalize drugs. So, you know, your um, uh, your legacy will be a good one, I imagine. This book is fantastic, Neil. I thoroughly recommend everybody read this. It's it's not because this is not a book about yourself. This is about, um, um, you know, I'm talking to the listener here. It's not a book about yourself. It's a book about the world and how dramatically the world can change if we legalise drugs. It's been a real eye-opener. Thank you so much for coming on, Neil. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'll, I'll keep trying to spread the word. Cheers, Neil. Thank you. <laughs>